one of the dead giveaways to a group being made out of a product of other pieces is if that group can be arranged, if the elements of that group can be arranged in a way that it forms its own nice little multiplication table, its own little times table internally to the group. When that happens, we'll see that there's automatically a normal subgroup structure at play, and we'll be able to define this happening as an internal direct product. So in this video, we'll define what it means for a group to be an internal direct product of two of its normal subgroups, and what are some of the implications of that. So by way of example, uh, let's think about the multiplicative group of units modulo 80. So this group has a fairly large number of elements in it. Um, if we want to understand what its structure looks like, let's take 80 and break it apart into the relatively prime factors 16 and 5. Inside of U80, there's a subgroup that's congruent to 1 mod 5. So all the elements of U80 that are congruent to 1 mod 5. So that consists of these uh, eight numbers here. Um, and this group, if we looked at its structure, uh, it would be isomorphic to U16. So all we'd have to do is do the, the products mod 80 and figure out that they behave the same way that the multiplicative units mod 16 behave. Likewise, there's another subgroup consisting of the elements of U80 that are congruent to 1 mod 16. So if I start at 1 and I count by 16s, counting only those that are uh, relatively prime to 80. I'll get 17, 33, and 49. That's a group of four elements, and it's going to be isomorphic to U5. So inside of U80, we can identify a subgroup which is isomorphic to U16, and a subgroup which is isomorphic to U5. Because G is an abelian group, all of its subgroups are guaranteed to be normal. Therefore, we've just identified two normal subgroups inside of G. The other thing that's important about these normal subgroups is that they don't overlap too much. Um, they only share in common what every pair of subgroups must share in common, namely they must share the identity element. And that's the only thing that exists in the overlap between these two subgroups. So the question I want to ask is, do these two subgroups form the first row and the first column of an internal times table for my group U80? Can we make all the other elements of U80 by multiplying some element from this subgroup by some element from that subgroup. Well, to figure that out, let's just try an example. If I take 41 and I multiply by 49, then as integers, we get 2009. But reducing mod 80, we get 9. So the number 9, uh, if we place it at this place in my times table, first of all, we ask, does 9 actually belong to U80? And the answer is, yes, it does. 9 and 80 are relatively prime one to another. So we know 9 is going to be one of the elements in this multiplicative group. Can all the rest of the elements be made in the same way? If we just brute force this and do all these multiplications and reduce mod 80, what we find out at the end of the day is we haven't listed any element more than once. And taken together, we've listed all of the elements of the multiplicative group mod 80. All of the numbers less than 80, which are relatively prime to 80, are here in this table once and only once. And so the answer is yes, we have formed the entire group U80 as an internal, its own little times table, with this purple normal subgroup as uh, the first row, and this green normal subgroup as the first column. This again is going to appear to us to be the best of all possible worlds. We have a pair of normal subgroups inside of my group, and they form the first row and column of a times table for the entire group. That means that, taken together, these two subgroups can explain all the properties of the larger group in which they reside. This is a situation in which we are going to call G, the larger group, the internal direct product of the normal subgroup H and the normal subgroup K. So the first thing is, we want our subgroups to each be normal so that we can use them as building blocks. And then we also want them not to overlap too much. Right? Uh, if we have too much overlap, then probably we're going to start repeating elements inside of my times table, and we don't want that. So we want the overlap of these two normal subgroups to be minimal. And the smallest overlap that we can get is that they overlap only at the identity. So G is called the internal direct product, H cross K. If H and K are normal subgroups of G, if their intersection is a trivial subgroup, so only the identity element is what they share in common, and G is equal to H times K, so as sets, every element of G can be written as an element of H times an element of K. Something from the purple row times something from the green row. And the fact that these 
only overlap at the identity will actually guarantee more for us. They'll guarantee that not only can we write every element of G as a product of an H and a K, but that we can do so in one and only one way. And in our example of the group U80, that'll show that U80 is equal to the internal direct product of this subgroup H and that subgroup K, but H is isomorphic to U16, K is isomorphic to U5, and so what we can say is that U80 is isomorphic to the internal direct product of U16 with U5. In other words, the internal direct product of a normal subgroup isomorphic to U16 and a normal subgroup isomorphic to U5. So what we've just talked ourselves into is that an internal direct product is valuable because it means that every single element in my group can be written in a unique way as a product of an element from H, the subgroup H, and another element from the subgroup K. That that happens in a unique fashion. But that also shows us why the internal direct product is not that different from the other kind of product that we already know about, the external direct product. So what we want to justify now is if I know, for example, that 9 in U80 is equal to 41 from H multiplied by 49 from K, and that that's a unique correspondence, 9 is correspondent to the pair 41 and 49, then couldn't we take the numbers 41 and 49 and place them in an ordered pair instead? Instead of multiplying them by one another, let's just put them as the coordinates in an ordered pair. But that ordered pair would belong not to the internal direct product, but rather to the external direct product. But because of the uniqueness that we have up here, there is actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in the external direct product, the group of ordered pairs of elements of H and elements of K, and the internal direct product, which are the elements of my group G that I get by multiplying my element of H by my element of K. And therefore, we've shown at least on, a, on an elements level why it's true that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in the external direct product of H and K and the internal direct product of H and K. The only thing we don't yet know is why is this an isomorphism of groups? So why is all the algebra that happens over here the same as the algebra that happens over here? After all, if H and K are part of an external direct product, their operations don't interact with one another whatsoever. They don't cross that masking tape line down the center of Lucy's house, right? Meanwhile, H times K in an internal direct product, all of that operation is enmeshed, like maximally enmeshed with one another because it all comes from the operation of the larger group G. So how do we know that there's an isomorphism of groups here and not just a bijection of set elements? Well, if I pick any element from the internal direct product, I can write it in a unique way as H times K. And I can send that uh, in this isomorphism over to the ordered pair H comma K. And I know how to go backwards. Just take H comma K and send it back to the product H times K. And we know why it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but to check that the homomorphism property holds, we need to know something a little bit more. We need to know that the element... The, the product of elements in the external direct product, h1k1 times h2k2, gets sent via this function to the corresponding product of elements in the internal direct product, which would be h1h2, k1, k2. In order to guarantee that that happens, I need to know why it is that h2 and k1 can trade places. After all, when I do this product in the external direct product, I'm going to get h1 times h2 and k1 times k2 acting separately. But in order to turn it into the corresponding product in the internal direct product, this H2 and that K1 have to trade places. How do we know that they can do that? Well, to figure out why, let's take H2 and K1, and let's multiply by the inverse of H2 times the inverse of K1. One of the ways to show that two elements commute is to take their product and multiply by not the shoes and socks inverse, but just the socks. Right? Just take the, the inverses, but don't, sw don't swap the order h2 inverse, k1 inverse. If we can show that this product is equal to the identity, then we've shown that h2, k1 is equal to k1, h2. So why is this product called the commutator of h2 and k1 equal to the identity? Well, on the one hand, I can see this conjugation of k1 by h2 and the inverse of h2. This conjugation, because k is a normal subgroup, therefore k is closed under conjugation, this conjugate must therefore belong to k. And so what I have here is an element of k times the inverse of k1. But k1 belongs to the subgroup k, and therefore this is an element of k times another element of k, 
and therefore that product has to belong to k. On the other hand, if instead of grouping the first three factors in this product, I had grouped the last three factors in this product, what I have there is an element of h conjugated by an element of k, but because h is a normal subgroup, it's closed under conjugation as well, and so this product of three factors over here belongs to h. Because h is a normal subgroup, it's closed under conjugation. And what I have here now is h2, which is an element of h, multiplied by another element of h, which by closure gives me an element of h. So just by looking at this product of four group elements in two different ways, by regrouping with the associative property, I've been able to show it's both an element of k and also an element of h. But we know that for an internal direct product, h and k only have one element in common, namely the identity element. Therefore, anything which belongs to both h and k must be equal to the identity. And if that's equal to the identity, that means h2k1 is equal to k1h2, which means I can trade places in this factor right here, and therefore show that the homomorphism property for the function which maps the ordered pair hk to the product h times k in the internal direct product does indeed satisfy the homomorphism property, and is therefore an isomorphism of groups. So that's kind of the really good news about this, is that we learned a new kind of product, the internal direct product, which is a product in which two sort of perpendicular, if you like, two orthogonal, two normal subgroups of a group G can combine together to make an internal times table for that group. And that feels like a brand new exciting fact, and it is, because it's how we can build a larger group out of its normal subgroups. But at the same time, we also learned that up to isomorphism, it doesn't give us a new kind of product. Up to isomorphism, it's the same thing as if I had just taken the external direct product of those two subgroups in the first place, pretending as though they didn't reside within the original group to begin with.